Stories and Sounds ASMR. It has been a very long time. Life has been absolutely insane, but it's finally calming down so I can get back to doing some of this stuff. In this video today, I'm going to start a book. It's Public Enemies, a prelude to war, spring 1933, Washington, D.C., Saturday, March 4th. It was a morning as bleak as the times. Gray clouds sagged low over the city, nudged along by a north wind and gusts of rain. A hundred thousand people stood outside the Capitol, waiting. The mood in the crowd was hushed, anxious. A few pointed to the rooftops. What are those things that look like cages? Someone asked. Machine guns, said a woman. The sense of crisis was underscored by the nervous young soldiers who stood by on street corners, fingering their rifles. The atmosphere, wrote Arthur Crock in the New York Times, was comparable to that which might be found in a beleaguered capital in wartime. The analogy was apt. It did feel like war. People were shell-shocked. The country they had known, the fat and happy America of the Jazz Age, of speakeasies and fun, and slow gin fizzes had vanished, destroyed as utterly as if wiped out by an enemy's bombs. Women who once spent their evenings dancing to Charleston now shuffled forward in breadlines, grimy and hopeless. Fathers who sank their savings in the stock market now sat in gutters begging for change. A bugle called. Everywhere heads turned. The president-elect appearing unsteady stepped up the maroon carpeted ramp to the lectern. The Chief Justice Charles Evan Hughes read the oath of office. When he was finished, Franklin Delano Roosevelt stepped to the lectern and gripped it tightly. His face was grim. Let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. He intoned, nameless unreasoning, unjustified terror, which paralyzes needed efforts to convert retreat into advance. Roosevelt looked out over the crowd. This nation asks for action, and action now. He continued, We must move as a trained and loyal army willing to sacrifice for the good of a common discipline. I shall ask the Congress for the one remaining instrument to meet the crisis. Broad executive power to wage a war against the emergency as great as the power that would be given to me if we were in fact invaded by a foreign foe. Afterward, when the president disappeared back into the capital, few in the crowd felt reassured. Mention of war left many frightened. There was talk of martial law, anarchy, dictatorship. Few understood what kind of war the president intended. Anything seemed possible. What no one could know that morning was that one theater of the metaphoric war Roosevelt invoked would in fact involve guns and blood and death on American soil. It would be fought across a great swath of the country's midsection, beginning at a railroad station in Kansas City before engulfing the streets of Chicago. Pine shrouded lodges in northern Wisconsin, dust bowl farms in weary Oklahoma, and battle sites scattered from Atlantic City to Dallas, St. Paul to Florida, and would be fought not by soldiers, but by another branch of the federal government, an obscure arm of the Justice Department, headed by an equally obscure bureaucrat named John Edgar Hoover, who in a span of 20 short months would rise from nowhere to hunt down a series of criminals whose exploits were to become a national soap opera and then a legend. When one looks back across a chasm of 17 years through a prism of pulp fiction and bad gangster movies, there is a tendency to view the events of 1933 to 34 as mythic, as folkloric. To the generations of Americans raised since World War II, the identities of criminals such as Charles Pretty Boy Floyd, Babyface Nelson, Ma Barker, John Dillinger, and Clyde Barrow are no more real 
than our Luke Skywalker or Indiana Jones. After decades spent in the washing machine of popular culture, their stories have been bled of all reality to an extent that few Americans today know who these people actually were, much less that they all rose to national prominence at the same time. They were real. A wastrel Dallas thief turned multiple murderer Clyde Barrow was born in 1909, the same year as Barry Goldwater and Ethel Merman. Had he lived, he would have been 65 years old when Richard Nixon resigned the presidency in 1974. An aging coupon clipper, maybe. Spending evenings in a parka lounger, chuckling at Archie Bunker. Babyface Nelson's widow died only in 1987 after years of watching her grandchildren drum their fingers on MTV. After spending 25 years in prison, Machine Gun Kelly's widow died in Tulsa in 1985. There remain people alive today who crouched behind teller cages as Dillinger robbed their neighborhood bank, who watched as Bonnie and Clyde shot innocent sheriffs, who tossed baseballs with Babyface Nelson. Kelly and Floyd gave birth to children who still tell their parents' stories. They were the boogeymen for the children who have become known as the greatest generation. In the spring of 1933, when men like John Dillinger were ascending the national stage, a 22-year-old named Ronald Reagan was broadcasting college baseball games on WHO Radio in Des Moines. 20-year-old Richard Nixon was acting in plays at Whittier College in Southern California, while a pair of third graders James Earl Carter in Plains, Georgia, and George Herbert Walker Bush in Greenwich, Connecticut, were learning multiplication tables. At high school dances in Hoboken, New Jersey, girls were swooning to a 17-year-old crooner named Frances Sinatra. At a house on Judson Avenue in Evanston, Illinois, a hyperactive nine-year-old named Marlon Brando was learning to box. Yet, as these and other members of that generation pass from the scene, it is difficult to imagine a time when name-brand outlaws stalked 20th century America. In a world of pocket telephones, internet shopping, and laser-guided bombs, the notion of marauding gangs of bank robbers wrecking havoc across the country is almost too outlandish to grasp. A story one might hear of the Wild West, but it wasn't the Wild West. It was America in 1933, eight years before Pearl Harbor, 12 years before Hiroshima, 23 years before Elvis, 36 before Woodstock. For all the surface contrasts, there was no internet, no television, no infrared cameras or satellite imagery. America in 1933 wasn't all that different from America today. Long distant telephone calls were routine. So was air travel. Both cops and robbers could and sometimes did fly to their jobs. The most influential publications included the New York Times and Time Magazine. Men and women dressed much as they do today. The only marked difference was a preference for hats. Men in sharp fedoras and jaunty straw boaters. Society women in frilly lace things. Ordinary girls in Gilligan hats pulled low over their bangs. Hollywood dominated mainstream culture. Popular films that spring were Boris Karloff's Frankenstein, John Wise Muller's First Tarzan, and Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Mutiny on the Bounty topped bestseller lists. Radio was up and running, but barely half the country's homes had a set. What distinguished those early months of 1933 was that so many Americans had no money to enjoy any of this. The stock market crash of, 19, of 1929 had degenerated into an economic depression. Hundreds of thousands of men lost their jobs. On reflection, that spring would be seen as a low point. Muddy shanty towns spread along the Potomac River beneath Riverside Drive in New York and in Chicago, Boston, and San Francisco. Thousands of families, including a legion of dirty children, lived nomadic lives in railroad cars, rumbling across the Midwest, lurching from town to town in search of a better life that was nowhere to be found. In Washington, there were marches, 
some of them violent. Scenes of tanks and soldiers pushing back desperate men hungering for jobs. People were angry. They blamed the government. They blamed the banks as Roosevelt delivered his inaugural address. That drizzly March morning, a group of government bureaucrats in dark suits listened around the radio in a third floor office at the corner of Vermont and K Streets in downtown Washington. What they did was little known to anyone outside their families. Their supervisor was a squat, beady-eyed man, 38 years old, with a flattened nose and loose bags under his eyes. His resemblance to a bulldog was much remarked upon. That morning, J. Edgar Hoover was preoccupied with keeping his job. Today, going on four decades after his death in 1972, it's difficult to remember a time when Hoover was not the monolithic figure whose secret files count of American presidents, who underwrote Senator Joseph McCarthy's Star Chamber, who hounded national figures as varied as Martin Luther King Jr., Algeris, and the Rosenbergs. For four decades, Hoover dominated American law enforcement as no person before or since, single-handedly creating the country's first national police force. His legacy is as complex as the man himself. Before Hoover, American law enforcement was a decentralized polyglot of county sheriffs and urban police departments, too often crippled by corruption. By and large, it was Hoover who brought the level of efficiency, professionalism, and centralized control the nation knows to this day. But his accomplishments will forever be sullied by the, bu by the abuses of power, rampant illegal wiretapping, break-ins, and harassment of civil rights groups of his later years. Hoover's power did not evolve slowly. It erupted during the great crime wave of 1933-34. to 34. He entered this period an anonymous federal functionary, his bureau struggling to shake past scandals. In 20 months, he emerged a national hero, a household name lauded in films, books, and comic strips. In 600 days, the modern FBI was born. This book is the story of how it happened. That morning, Hoover was director of the Justice Department's Bureau of Investigation, not the Federal Bureau of Investigation. It wouldn't get that name for another two years. For simplicity's sake, it will be referred to as FBI throughout this book. He had been in office nine years since, since 1924. But he had enemies, lots of them, and Roosevelt's men made it clear that he would probably be replaced. The final decision was to be made by a new attorney general, a confirmed Hoover, a confirmed Hoover hater named Thomas Walsh. That Thursday, two days before Roosevelt's address, Walsh, a 72-year-old senator from Montana, had boarded a train from Miami to Washington with his new bride, a Cuban debutante. Friday morning, Mrs. Walsh awakened aboard the train in North Carolina and found her husband dead. Whispers in the Capitol suggested the elderly senator had expired following an athletic bout of sex. For Hoover, the reprieve was temporary. After all he had achieved in the last nine years, it was calling to him that mere politicians held his fate.
bureaucracy. There was little question that he would follow his father, a deskman at the U.S. Coast and Geodetic Survey, into government work. Hoover went to night school at George Washington University, where he joined the Kappa Alpha fraternity. Working days as a clerk at the Library of Congress, he received his Bachelor of Law degree in 1916 and his Master's a year later, the same year that he passed the District of Columbia Bar. In July 1917, he took a job as a clerk at Justice. Many of the department's up-and-coming young lawyers were gone, enlisted in the war effort, and Hoover, sharply dressed in a demon for detail, stood out earning two promotions in his first six months. He went to work in the alien registration section and moved up quickly. By 1919, at the age of 24, he was named head of the General Intelligence Division, a newly created bureau charged with prosecuting labor radicals, anarchists, and communists. He earned high marks in his first interview in the New York Times as a driving force behind the department's January 1920 raids on communists in 33 cities, which led to the arrest of more than 3,000 people. He lobbied for and received his new job as assistant director of the Bureau of Investigation in August 1921. A Senate probe of the Bureau in 1924 led to the resignations and indictments of the BI chief and the Attorney General. The new Attorney General, Harlan Fisk Stone, was at a loss about what to do with the Bureau. He scribbled down notes of its problems, filled with men with bad records, many convicted of crimes, organization lawless, agents engaged in many practices which are brutal and tyrannical in the extreme. Stone had no idea who could reform such an outfit, a friend suggested Hoover. He was young, but he was honest and industrious. Stone asked around, liked what he heard, and on May 10, 1924, summoned Hoover to his office and handed him interim of the Bureau. Hoover's first priority was transforming his force of field agents, which numbered 339 in 1929. His vision was precise. He wanted young, energetic white men between 25 and 35 with law degrees, clean, neat, well-spoken, bright, and from solid families, men like himself. He got them. In a matter of weeks, Hoover cleared out the Deadwood, stopped patronage hiring, and instituted a meritocracy. Applicants were screened on general intelligence, conduct during interview, and personal appearance, either neat, flashy, poor, or untidy. Hoover ruled by absolute fiat. His men lived in fear of him. Inspection teams appeared at field offices with no notice, writing up agents who were even one minute tardy for work. Hoover tolerated no sloth, sloppiness, or deviation from the new rules that came pouring into every field office, each commanded by a special agent in charge, known as a sack. There were 25 in 1929. The tiniest infraction could cost a man his job. When a Denver sack offered a visitor a drink, he was fired. I want the public to look upon the Bureau of Investigation and the Department of Justice as a group of gentlemen, Hoover told an audience in 1926. And if the men here engaged can conduct themselves in office as such, I will dismiss them. Many were Southern. More than a few came from Hoover's alma mater, George Washington, especially its Kappa Alpha chapter. Hoover's wise and number two man 
Western lawmen. These cowboys were a breed apart. They chewed tobacco and drank and spit in fractions Hoover ignored. The cowboys knew how to run investigations, and that's what they did. In violation of bureau regulations, several carried guns. In Washington, John Keith wore matched Colt 45s. In Dallas, Charles Winstead used a 357 Magnum. In Chicago, the former Texas Ranger James C. Doc White favored a bone-handled Colt, ascending it with a knife hidden in his boot. The two agents assigned to run key cases in Hoover's early years were veteran cowboys Gus T. Jones, the San Antonio Sack, and Doc White's older brother, an ex-ranger named Thomas White, the Oklahoma City Sack. Hoover's reorganization transformed the Bureau. Unproductive field offices were closed. Bureaucracy was streamlined. A chain of command was drawn. Paperwork was standardized. After six months, the Bureau was on its way to becoming the very model of a modern, efficient government organization. The interim was removed from Hoover's title. Once the Bureau was retooled, the challenge became finding something for its agents to do. In Hoover's first six years, his men spearheaded a corruption investigation at the federal prison in Atlanta, and a probe of murders and oil rights thievery, and oil rights thievery on Indian lands in Oklahoma. They were minor cases, all run by the cowboys. Tom White handled the Atlanta and Oklahoma investigations. When White was named warden at Leavenworth, when White was named warden at Leavenworth in 1927, Hoover summoned Gus Jones to supervise a vain attempt to capture a set of high-profile escapees. On all these cases, Hoover's men did the legwork but stepped aside when it was time to make arrests, sometimes to the snickers of police. I can remember calling policemen when a wanted fugitive is at such and such place, Hugh Clegg recalled. The policemen will tell me, well, you guard the back and I'll go in the front. You don't have a gun, so I'll go in. I've stood at the back door of a house, had only a brick bat in my hand, hoping that the fugitive would not come out that way. If he'd come out shooting, I had no defense at all, no offensive weapons, and you're just at his mercy. Hoover's role was strictly administrative. He seldom left Washington, where he worked from an office decorated with fine Chinese antiques. In the spring of 1933, while billing himself as the nation's leading law enforcement expert, Hoover himself had never made an arrest, much less fired a gun in anger. The Sacks ran the investigations, Hoover peering over their shoulders, firing off memos at anything he disliked. He and Pop Nathan could be scathing in their appraisals. Privately, both knew they had few competent men. I believe that the trouble with many of our offices is that our agents in charge are somewhat foggy mentally, Nathan wrote in a memo to Hoover in June 1932, or at any rate, they function slowly along mental lines. Like any good civil servant, Hoover made certain the public knew how well he was doing. He gave speeches and occasional newspaper interviews, emphasizing the Bureau's integrity and its devotion to what he called scientific policing, based on fingerprints and evidentiary analysis. Not all the press was receptive. A 1933 article in Collier's characterized the Bureau as Hoover's personal and political machine. More inaccessible than precedents, he keeps his agents in fear and awe by firing and shifting them at whim. No other government agency had such a turnover of personnel. It was the Collier's article that first hinted at Hoover's Achilles heel, the rumors of his sexual orientation. In appearance, Mr. Hoover looks utterly unlike the storybook sleuth, it noted. He dresses fastidiously, with Eleanor Blue as the favorite color for the matched shades of tie, handkerchief, and socks. He is short, fat, business-like, and walks with mincing step. After eight years of pursuing minor crimes, Hoover's first opportunity to perform on the national stage came in June 1932, with the passage of the Lindbergh Law.
three months after the kidnapping, the subsequent murder of Charles Lindbergh's infant son in Hopewell, New Jersey. The new law made kidnapping a federal crime, but only where the kidnapper or his victim had crossed a state border. The Lindbergh kidnapping spawned a rash of copycat crimes throughout 1932. But to Hoover's frustration, none of the kidnappings fell in his domain. But as word spread in the underworld of massive ransoms to be had, kidnappings flourished. The year 1933 brought 27 major cases, more than twice the number reported in any previous year, so many that the New York Times began charting them in a periodic column, beginning with the kidnapping of the millionaire Charles Boster II in Denver that February. FBI agents stormed into a half dozen high-profile cases for the first time finding themselves involved in solving crimes the public actually cared about. As Roosevelt took office that spring, kidnapping stories thronged front pages across the country. Coming on the heels of the surge in crime during the 1920s, symbolized by Al Capone, these reports added fuel to the debate over the need for a federal police force. On one side were reformers who charged that municipal police were too often corrupt and ineffective and unable to deal with increasingly mobile criminals who crossed state lines like cracks in a sidewalk. On the other side were powerful city governments, jealous of their turf, backed by congressmen who viewed federal policing as the first step toward an American Gestapo. Anti-federalism still ran strong in America. There remained, especially in the South and Midwest, an undercurrent of deep mistrust toward Washington. Feelings that grew as citizens came to blame politicians for the Depression. The debate intensified with Roosevelt's election. His advisors were pushing hard for a strong central government that could revive the economy by taking control of many areas managed by state and municipal governments, including law enforcement. During the first hundred days of the Roosevelt administration, a period that famously saw dozens of pieces of New Deal legislation stream through Congress, the leading voice for a federal police force was a Roosevelt advisor named Louis Howe, the attorney general chosen to replace Thomas Walsh, a Connecticut attorney named Homer S. Cummings, was perhaps unsurprisingly possessed of similar views. That spring, Howe and Cummings began discussing how best to reform the Justice Department and what role, if any, it might play in federal policing. From Hoover, Roosevelt's election was an all-or-nothing proposition of the few pundits who took notice. Most believed Hoover would be fired. Had Senator Walsh lived, he almost certainly would have been. But if he could somehow persuade the White House of his value, Hoover could see there was a chance, a remote one, to be sure, that this little bureau might serve as the centerpiece of a federal police force. A number of his government competitors had the same idea, most notably Elmer Irie, the head of the Internal Revenue Service's aggressive investigative arm, which could boast of its 1931 toppling of Capone. That spring, Hoover launched a vigorous lobbying campaign to keep his job and to position himself for something more. Sacks were ordered to arrange letters of support from prominent politicians. Hoover's old boss, Harlan Fisk Stone, now a Supreme Court justice, wrote Justice Felix Frankfurter, who contacted Roosevelt. Still anti-Hoover sentiment remained widespread. One Roosevelt advisor later wrote that there was tremendous pressure on Roosevelt by various city politicians to replace Hoover with this or that police chief whom they believed would be more amenable to them for patronage. All that spring, Hoover's future hung in the balance. Only a cynic would have pointed out the obvious. What Hoover needed was a tangible achievement, something to grab headlines, a case that would thrust him into the public spotlight and underscore the Bureau's transformation. He was about to get it. <laughs>
from a group of criminals over whose activities the FBI had absolutely no jurisdiction. Bank robbers, the first recorded U.S. bank robbery, actually a nighttime burglary, came in 1831 when a man named Edward Smith snuck into a Wall Street bank and made off with $245,000. He was caught and sentenced to a five-year term in Sing Sing. Smith's brainstorm led to an early advance in U.S. bank security, the advent of safes. In 1834, until the Civil War, armed robberies of banks were all but unknown. During the war, Confederate raiders robbed several northern banks, but the first recorded bank robbery by a civilian came in December 15, 1863, when an irate man named Edward Green wandered into a bank in Malden, Massachusetts, shot a banker in the head, and, as an afterthought, scooped up $5,000. For his place in history, Green earned an 1866 date with a noose. The first organized bank robbery in peacetime, an 1866 raid in Liberty, Missouri, was carried out by a ragtag band of out-of-work Confederate irregulars, led by the brothers Frank and Jesse James. The James gang's string of robberies over the, over the next 15 years was glamorized by the press, bringing bank robbery to the attention of a number of Western imitators, including the Dalton brothers, Bill Doolin, and the Hole in the Wall gang of Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. With the migration of Cassidy's core group to South America in 1901, and the shrinking of the Western frontier, bank robbing faded from popular consciousness. Banks continued to be robbed, but no outlaw achieved national notoriety. And while statistics are unreliable, the number of armed robberies probably fell during the years before World War I. Nor did they soar after the war. Until the mid-1920s, most ambitious thieves preferred nocturnal bank burglaries. A case in point was the Newton Gang, a band of four Texas brothers who had dozens of Midwestern banks between 1919 and 1924. Their tactics were those of burglars across the nation. They broke into banks at night, used a nitroglycerin explosion to pop safe doors, and were generally gone before a sheriff could mobilize pursuit. This strategy worked until banks reacted in the mid-1920s by introducing reinforced safes and alarms. The Newtons and their peers were forced to initiate daylight robberies. Their biggest strike, the two million dollar robbery of a mail train in Roundout, Illinois, outside Chicago, was the decade's largest. When the federal government suddenly found itself engaged in open warfare, the groups of heavily armed bank robbers in 1934, many asked why. The common answer was the depression. It was true as far as it went. Many bank robbers were desperate, unemployed men. But blaming the great crime wave of 1933-34 to 34 on the Depression ignores the fact that the years between 1925 and 1932 amounted to a golden age of American bank robbers. Known in the press as Yegmen or Yegs, robberies along what came to be known as the Crime Corridor, from Texas to Minnesota, soared. Between 1920 and 1929, the Travelers Insurance Company reported that property crimes, from bank robberies to drugstore stick-ups, jumped from 17 to 965 a year in its Dallas office, 30 to 300 in Gary, Indiana, 9 to 836 in Saginaw, Michigan. The violence that catapulted men like John Dillinger to prominence in 1934 wasn't the beginning of a crime wave, it was the end of one. The spread of the bank robberies was the result of technology outstripping the legal system. Faster, more powerful weapons, especially the 800 bullet per minute Thompson submachine gun, introduced after World War II, allowed Yeggs to outgun all but the best armed urban policemen. But the greatest impetus was the automobile, especially new models with reliable, powerful V8 engines. While a county sheriff was still hand-cranking his old Model A, a modern Yegg could speed away untouched. 
French man may have been the first to use a car to escape a bank robbery in 1915. One of the first Americans to try it was an aging Oklahoma yegg, Henry Starr, who used a Nash to rob a bank in Harrison, Arkansas in 1921. The practice caught on. 75% of all crimes now are perpetrated with the aid of the automobile. One crime writer noted in 1924, automobiles and good roads have done much to increase certain types of banditry. We now have a definitely established type called an automobile bandit who operates exclusively in motor vehicles. Whether it is to perpetrate a hold up on a bank or merely to stick up pedestrians and rob homes, lawmen were powerless to chase the new auto bandits across state lines making border areas, especially the notorious tri-state region of Missouri, Oklahoma, and Kansas, magnets for crime. The federal government was no help. Bank robbery wasn't yet a federal crime. Coordination between police departments was spotty. Only a few states had introduced statewide police, and those that had, had seldom possessed the resources to break a major case in their place. Vigilante committees sprang up across the Midwest. Not that it mattered. If a yegg fled a bank robbery without getting shot, there was little chance he would ever be caught. All of which made bank robbery a tempting vocation to a Midwestern populace that faced more temptations than ever. During the 1920s, mass-produced goods such as dresses, washing machines, and radios became widely available. Yet, with the drought and the resulting downturn in the Midwestern farm economy, fewer citizens could afford the goods that lay out of reach behind department store windows. A single bank robbery could change a dirt farmer's life at a time when the average household income in states like Oklahoma and Missouri hovered below $500 a year. Bank robbers could make off with $10,000 for a morning's work. The Newton brothers typified mistake-prone amateurs who ushered in the motorized age. They were arrested in the wake of their roundout Illinois job. The criminal credited with introducing a new level of professionalism to bank robbery was Herman K. Lamb, a German emigre known as the Baron. Born in 1880, Lamb is a quasi-mythic figure. Some claim he began his career with the Hole in the Wall gang. What is known is that around 1917, while in a Utah prison, he developed a rigorous system for robbing banks. Lamb pioneered the casing of banks, the observation of bank guards, alarms, and tellers. A bank was known as a jug, and an expert caser of banks was known as a jug marker. Each member of Lamb's gang was assigned a role in the robbery. The lookout, the getaway driver, the lobby man, the vault man, most important, Lamb is credited with devising the first detailed getaway maps, or GITs. Once he targeted a bank, Lamb mapped the nearby back roads, known as cat roads, to a tenth of a mile, listing each landmark and using a stopwatch to time distances. Any teenager with a bird gun could rob a bank. It was getting away that posed a challenge. Lamb's detailed GITs, clipped to the dashboard of a car, work out of the getaway. His gang was credited with dozens of robberies during the 1920s until Lamb was shot and killed near Clinton, Indiana in 1930. By then, his system had been widely imitated. Two of his men 
base in St. Paul. Bailey mentored a number of young bank men who congregated at the city's notorious Green Lantern Tavern, including Machine Gun Kelly, Alvin Carpus, and the Barker Brothers, arrested on a Kansas City golf course in 1932. He led a massive prison breakout on May 31, 1933, and went back to robbing banks. The last of the great Jazz Age Yeggs was the man who smuggled guns freed Bailey from prison, his friend Frank Jelly Nash. Nash, a stout figure with a comic toupee, who began his career robbing trains on horseback in his native Oklahoma, was a Leavenworth escapee who also worked out of St. Paul robbing banks with Bailey and the Barker Gang. All three of these men, Eddie Bence, Harvey Bailey, and Frank Nash, were destined to play roles in the great crime wave of 1933-34. to It was Nash who accidentally triggered the war with J. Edgar Hoover's FBI. He did it not with a bank robbery or a high-profile kidnapping, but with a simple desire for a quiet Arkansas vacation. Okay, that's the end of the very first chapter of Public Enemies by Brian Burrow. Thanks for listening.